Praise God. Well, if you have a Bible this morning, I'd like for you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we're going to read these verses once again. We read them last week. I'm going to, rem I'm going to uh, read them again. Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 1, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. And what profit has he that worketh in that wherein he labors? He's asking, what do working people gain from all of their hard work? A lifetime of hard work. What do work, working people gain? Verse 10, I've seen the travail which God has given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. I've seen the labor. I've seen the work. I've seen the employment. I've seen their busyness. All the things that, that men do, they're occupied with, oppressed by, employed by, humbled by. He says in verse 11, He has made everything beautiful in His time. He set the world in their heart. I like what uh, it actually reads. He set eternity in their heart. God has put eternity in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there's no good in them or nothing better in them. I know that there's nothing better but for a man to rejoice, or as one version translates it, nothing better than for a man to be cheerful and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. It's okay to be blessed. It's okay to enjoy the fruit of your labors. He says, it is the gift of God. In other words, the ability to enjoy your life is God's gift. It is the gift of God. He goes on and says, I know that whatsoever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from it. And God does it that men should fear or reverence before him. You know, in the light of the fact that there's a day to be born, and a day to die. And as I said last week, in between those two dates, the birth date, the death date, life is not lived in a straight, steady line. Life is more like a graph. It's up and down, peaks and valleys, highs and low, good times, tough times, wonderful times, horrible times. But we all go from the birth date eventually to the death date and in between all of that series of ups and downs and turns and twists, that's the stuff we call life. He tells us in verse 2, there's a time to pluck, there's a time to plant and a time to pluck up what's planted, a time for everything under the sun, right? A time to plant, some of you like to plant flowers and work in your vegetable gardens and so on. You know that there's a particular time of the year you're supposed to do that. Certain months that you're supposed to put it in the ground. 
And then there's times when you know it's done and you're supposed to pull all that stuff up so it's the, the land can recover and you can plant again next season. There's a time to plant. There's a time to pull up. But you know what? You, we're all planters. Whether you have a garden in your yard or not, you are planting. In fact, uh, by your very life, by the words you speak, you're planting into people's lives. You parents are always planting into the lives of your children. The words you speak to them, you're sowing seeds of encouragement and life and hope and faith. When you talk to them about the Lord, right? I mean, you are planting. You're planting into the, the people's lives all around you. When you talk about the Lord, when you give your witness and your testimony, you are sowing seeds of life. There is a time to plant. Some people get to reap what you planted when they get to pray with, with those folks and lead them to Christ. Sometimes we may get to reap what other people have sown. You know, we get to pray with people to lead them to Christ. And we think, boy, look at that. I, I talked to him for ten minutes and led him to the Lord. But what you didn't know is somebody's been praying for them for twenty years. Praying for them, sowing those seeds telling them things about the Lord, preparing the ground, cultivating the soil, watering it. All you did was pray with them. So don't pat yourself on the back. <laughs> right? There's a time to plant. And you know, when we plant, when we're sowing the seeds of life, the Word of God, into people's lives, you're also plucking up, whether you realize it or not. You're really pulling out the weeds of false religion, false tradition, false teachings, false philosophies of life. Because every time you plant a seed of what real values are, what's really precious, what's really important, a person's relationship with Christ, the peace they have in their heart knowing that they're born again, death holds no fear, you don't realize you're tearing out all kinds of foolish thoughts and notions people pick up through the years. You're planting and pulling out at the same time. There's a time for all of that. Look, he says there's a time for everything. To break down, to build up, to weep, to laugh. A time for it all. The Bible calls it seasons. There are seasons in every life. And seasons, well, the very word means change. Things are always changing all around us. We go through seasons of trial and adversity, like we spoke of last week. We all go through them. None are exempt. Wouldn't you like to get a pass? You know, just a, a free pass. No trials for two years or five years. Or no troubles, afflictions, tribulations for six months. That would be great, even for 30 days. Just give me a pass. But nobody gets a pass. Everybody goes through trial, trouble, tribulation, persecution, affliction, aggravation, problems. Don't think we're exempt because we're Christians. The very fact that we're Christians mean maybe we go through more. But through it all, the Lord remains faithful. Through it all, many of the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord, what? He delivers us out of them all. Well, the seasons are inevitable. Uh, you can't stop it. You're not going to be able to go outside. No matter what you do, you can't stop the fall from coming. It's coming. And no matter what you do, you won't be able to stop the winter from coming. It's going to happen. These seasons are inevitable. It's also inevitable that you will go through seasons of trial. You will also go through seasons of great times. Peace rejoicing, plenty, blessings. How many of you are looking forward to that? Yeah, yeah, I could go for some of that. But that's just the way it is. There's going to be times when we laugh and times when we cry. That's what the Bible says. There's going to be times when we rejoice and uh, times when we weep. That's, unfortunately, that's life. You know what we realize when you read Ecclesiastes 3 right here this graph these ups and downs and turns and twists you realize or at least we should things aren't always going to go our way 
They're just not always going to go our way. We're not, we're not always going to get our way. It's not the end of the world when you don't. Sometimes life will throw us curveballs. Sometimes there'll be things that'll come along we didn't quite expect. It didn't fall in according to our plan. So what do we do in such times? Well, we trust the Lord, just as we've done all along. One thing we can't do, we can't allow ourselves to become sour on life. I, I want to draw your attention to a couple of things today because I believe this is important for us. We're all going to go through these things. The Bible tells us that we really should enjoy life as much as possible. Verse 12, now let's look at a couple of verses. I know that there is no good in them or there's nothing better in them but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Look, we're only here for a season. It can be a very short season. However long we're here, the Bible says, spend your life rejoicing. Now the idea here is, uh, there's nothing better than to rejoice, to be cheerful, to have that kind of a disposition, and to do good. That is, to do what's right. To do the right thing. That is, we live our life for the Lord. And also that every man should eat and drink. Now he's not talking here about gluttony and drunkenness. He's talking here about enjoying the fruits of your own labors. The biblical call is for every man to who is physically uh, able to be able to support himself and his family to work and to enjoy the good of all his labor and that ability to enjoy the good of your labor to enjoy the life that you have is the gift of God now my point is this yes we're going to go through trials troubles tribulations and persecutions we're going to go through that but we cannot allow ourselves to become sour on life. We cannot allow ourselves to become jaded. We cannot allow ourselves to become bitter. We cannot allow ourselves to become cynical. We cannot allow ourselves to become just, you know, unpleasant to be around. Because we're always so downcast, downtrodden, down at the mouth, and depressing. We're not here for long. Verse 11, eternity is in our heart. We don't live for this world. We do live in this world with all of its, you know, seasons, changes, variableness, all these, this roller coaster ride we call life. And in a lot of ways, uh, life is like a roller coaster ride. Sometimes it moves slow, sometimes it moves fast, sometimes there are sharp turns, twists loop-de-loops and it's over fast just like a roller coaster but unlike a roller coaster unlike a roller coaster you don't get a second go round. no do-overs you don't get to do it again I remember the last time I rode on a roller coaster I was in Tampa Florida Diane and I were there I don't even remember why, but we were in Tampa for some reason, and there was a big old uh, amusement park there, and we decided to spend the day there. Now, when I was young, roller coaster rides were pretty neat. Uh, so I thought, you know, I'd ride in it, get out the line. Y'all remember the Zephyr and all that, you know? Get out of line, get in line again, ride it again, you know? Get out, the, get in the line. And I don't know how I let them talk me into riding on a roller coaster. But that thing jerked us around and up and down and loop-de-loops. And I remember saying while I'm, I'm riding it, this is not fun. <laughs> In fact, there is absolutely nothing about this that is fun. And if I get off of this thing, I will never do this again. <laughs> I think I had whiplash for about a week after I got off of it. 
And, and to this day, I, I can't see the thrill of a roller coaster ride. But sometimes that's, sometimes that's exactly what life is like. It can be horrifying. It can make your heart want to jump out of your chest. It can cause your heart to beat faster than you thought it could go. But it can also be joyful. Of course, I didn't get any joy out of that particular ride. But maybe when I was a kid it was fun. But at the same time, I used to like horror movies when I was a kid. I used to think that was fun. But I couldn't watch a horror movie today. Uh, simply, I guess, because I know uh, that there really are demons and devils and ogres and monsters and, uh, and such things. And uh, I got enough to contend with without having to... To deal with nightmares and things like that. <laughs> but look, look at what the Bible says. As much as is possible, it's good for a man to rejoice, to be cheerful, and to do good in his life. This, this is, there's nothing better. Be cheerful. Enjoy your life. Enjoy the ride as much as possible. Amen. We're not here for long. It's a short ride. Amen. So don't allow yourself to become bitter, cynical, angry it's too short a ride for that why be miserable I think that's a pretty good question why be miserable why just develop this miserable personality and miserable disposition I read not long ago about this couple an older couple married married forever and they hated each other they hated each other with a passion, told each other horrible, horrible things, horrible gestures and words to each other, literally hated each other with a poisonous tongue. And the old man used to tell his wife all the time, when I die, if I die first, I will climb up out of that grave and haunt you until the day you die. That's what he used to tell her. I will climb up out of that, I will scratch my way up and haunt you until the day you die. And then he died. And they buried him. And his wife went out and celebrated, having a great time, laughing, carrying on. And they asked her, aren't you afraid he's going to crawl his way up out of the grave like he threatened to do? She said, I'm not worried at all. Let the old booger try. Let him try. I buried him face down. <laughs> well, why well, be miserable? That is cold. It was funny, but it's cold. We do have to guard ourselves, though, from picking up these uh, unbiblical attitudes towards life. Do you know what? It's possible for a Christian to become so jaded and so sour that they're actually miserable to be around. Don't allow trials and adversities to poison our attitude and to poison our outlook on life so that it, it makes a person virtually want to give up. I've been around Christians. Actually, all they do is say, I wish I was dead. I just long to die. That's all I'm looking forward to is dying. I just want to die. Life is hard. Life is miserable. Uh, I hope you know that that's the wrong attitude to have. Now, Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, look, I'm ready to die. But he didn't say, I wish I was dead. Hello. That's right. He said, I'm ready. As far as, you know, being ready with God, right with God, spiritually right. I fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. He said, I'm ready to die. I'm ready. I'm ready. If death comes for me, I'm ready. But he didn't say, I wish I was dead.
every one of us has to recognize that one day we will die unless the Lord interrupts human history which he could do because I believe that that's going to happen could happen in our lifetime I hope it does I hope none of us die that we all fly But you know the Apostle Paul, even all the trials, troubles, afflictions, persecutions, beatings, torture, imprisonment, repeated arrests and beatings, all the things he went through, he never said, I wish I was dead. He never said, I just give up on life. No, he said, for me to live is Christ and to die, well, that's even better. To die is gain. To die is gain. But to live... Every day to live is Christ. That's the proper Christian attitude. Whatever life hands us, whatever our circumstance, we should follow uh, the pattern of the apostles and the Lord himself. What, what did Paul say when he was in a Philippian jail? Well, he, he wrote to the church and said, you need to rejoice in the Lord all the time. And again, I say rejoice. In fact, the epistle that we call the epistle of Christian joy was written from prison. Paul wrote it from a jail cell. He wasn't complaining, murmuring, grumbling, saying, I wish I was dead. When they arrested him and beat him and put his feet in stocks and bloody back and all beat up, bruised and battered, he's singing praises to God in the middle of a jail cell. He wasn't moaning and groaning, saying, I wish I was dead. Come on, y'all. Whatever his circumstances, he rejoiced. Now, I know that couldn't have been easy. I know it couldn't have been easy. Because when you're in pain, when you hurt, it's hard to think outside or beyond your own pain. It's hard to think outside or beyond your own agony. But here's the capacity of this man of God, and it's the capacity you and I should have. And that is the ability to think beyond himself and think that there are Christians out there who could use a word of encouragement. So in the midst of all of his agony, pain, and heartbreak, he writes to them and says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. He wasn't self-absorbed, right? But he was absorbed with the things of God, the work of God, the Word of God. I do know that there can be times of trial and trouble in our lives. There can be times of such devastating hurt or loss that you might be tempted to think, I'd just be better off dead. I just wish I was dead did. There might be times you're tempted to think that way, but today I want to drive home this thought. That is not a biblical way of thinking. Our thinking must always be according to the Word of God. For us to live is Christ, and every day we're here has purpose. Every day we're here, we're here for a reason. We have to realize, we have to understand, we have to grasp the reality of this truth your life has meaning and purpose your life has meaning and purpose your life has meaning and purpose every single one of us our lives have meaning and purpose you might think well I don't know what it is I don't know why I'm here I don't know what the purpose or meaning of my life is well I'm gonna tell you what it is today but I'm going to tell you first, you're here for a reason, and you're only here for a season. That season's going to be over soon enough without you wishing it along, you know, at a faster pace. And if you don't know what your purpose is in life, or your meaning is in life, then today is your day to find out. Because the Bible very specifically tells us what your meaning and your purpose in life is. Your purpose, your meaning, the reason you're here is to glorify God. That's why you're here. You're here to glorify God. 
to honor Him, to bring glory to His name, that your life, your witness, your words, your example, your behavior, your actions, it all honors and brings glory to God. The old Westminster Shorter Catechism said, and, and this is a great statement, I, I, I never forgot it, it said, the chief end of man, the chief end of man, that is the ultimate purpose, the reason, the very reason for our existence, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Yes. To glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. You know, the philosophers throughout life, the old Greek and Roman philosophers always pondered the meaning of life. Why are we here? What is this all about? Uh, that really has, uh, it's a pretty good question even today, especially with all of this new evolutionary uh, thought, you know, all the new evolutionary books and things like that. If, if evolution is true, we're here for no purpose and no meaning whatsoever. All we do is take up space. Our life is no more valuable than the life of a rabbit, a frog, a dog, a cat, a skunk, or anything else. Our life has no more meaning or purpose than any other critter. If evolution is true, but if we are created, if in fact man is the direct work of God, a creator, then life has a meaning and life has a purpose and life doesn't end at the grave. I want to read a couple of verses to you. Listen to this. First Chronicles 16, 28. The Bible says, Give unto the Lord, you kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. This is what we owe the Lord. Glory. And we're to give it to Him. Give Him glory. Psalms 22, 23. You that fear the Lord, praise Him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel, fear him, reverence him. But what are we to do? We're to glorify him. Listen to this one, Isaiah 42, 12. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands, all over to the far reaches of the world. Give glory to the Lord. In fact, Psalms 29, 2 says glory is due him. We owe it to him. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. But what are we to give to him? The glory due to his name. Pro uh, Proverbs 16 in verse 4 says this. The Lord has made all things for himself. He's made all things for himself. That is, you know, for, for his glory uh, and for his pleasure. All things were created, Revelation says. So he created us for his glory. Isaiah 43, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Isaiah 43, 7, he specifically says he created us for his glory. He created us to give him glory. He did not create us so that we can spend our lives in the accumulation of things. He did not create us so we can spend our lives in our own empty, shallow, self, selfish pursuits in the mad pursuit of pleasure or recreation or, or whatever. That's not why he created us. The Bible says we were created to give him glory. That's the whole purpose of our existence. And you and I are supposed to glorify him every single day of our lives, in every season of our lives. So that means we're supposed to glorify him even if you're going through those series and seasons of trial and trouble and affliction, it's easy to glorify Him in the good days. But what about the tough days, the difficult days? And that brings me to a very important question. Well, Brother Rusty, you say we're supposed to glorify God. That's my purpose for being. That's the very reason I live. In fact, the only way you will ever find fulfillment in your life, any sense of fulfillment, it's not going to come by getting that degree. Oh, if I just got that degree, I'd be fulfilled. Nope, that's not going to fulfill you. If I just got that job, if I got that promotion, if I ever got that position or that title, I'd be so fulfilled. No, you wouldn't. 
If I could just get that new car, that's what I want, that new car, that new house, the new furniture, the new clothes. If I can just get that, I'll be so fulfilled. No, nope, you won't. Not for long. One thing, one thing alone will fulfill you and fill the void in your life. And that is that you give your life to the glory of God. You live your life to the glory of God, for His glory. That is your purpose. And apart from fulfilling that purpose, you'll never have peace. You'll never have joy. You'll never have rest. You'll never have any sense of purpose. None, none whatsoever. In every season of our life. Okay, I'm supposed to glorify Him. How do I do that? How do I glorify God? What can I do to glorify God? I'm just the average Joe. I mean, I'm not some big name evangelist, preacher, teacher. I'm just a worker. I'm a blue collar a worker. I'm a housewife. I, I'm unemployed. How do I glorify God? I'm a plumber, a mechanic. Or whatever. How can I glorify God with my life? I'm so glad you asked. Because the Bible tells us how we glorify Him. You see, that's our calling, right? That's our purpose, to glorify God. That's why you're here, to glorify Him. And now let's look and see just how it is we do that. In Psalms 50, I want you to look here with me. Psalms 50, and we'll see what we do, how we live, To glorify God. Psalms 50 and verse 23. What can I do to glorify God? Well, Psalms 50, 23 says, Whoso offereth praise glorifies me. And to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. Wait, how do I glorify the Lord? Well, you glorify the Lord right here. You offer praise. Whoso, now that means whoever, whoever offereth, offer, offer, you know, to offer up, that, that means to sacrifice. Remember how Hebrews 13 speaks of the sacrifice of praise? By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Uh, it's the language of the altar. We're to offer the sacrifice of praise. Continually, by the way, not just occasionally. But whoever offers praise to God glorifies God. And the word, of course, praise means adoration, worship, veneration. It literally means to extend the hand. To extend the hand. Uh, it has, you know, many, many different shades of meaning. It means confession. Because in our praise and worship and adoration and the extension of our hands, we confess our sins. We confess our faith. We confess our love for the Lord. That's all part of praise. Whoso offereth praise glorifies me. That's what God says. We offer up this praise and we honor the Lord. We, we extend our hands in submission, in surrender, in adoration and worship, in confession of sin, in our thanksgiving towards God for all of his goodness. It's also interesting that the word praise has to do with singing as well. Uh, Strong translates it a choir of worshipers. So it has to do with our singing to the Lord, honoring Him with our voices. Remember, it's the fruit of our lips giving thanks to His name, Hebrews 13, 15. Psalms 86 and verse 12, listen to this. I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. You see, we're to glorify him. You glorify him with, with that praise. With your mouth of praise, worship, thanksgiving, adoration, confession of sin, confessing, 
your love for him, your thanksgiving towards him. All of this, all of this is included in the idea of praise. And, and in this, we glorify God. Why are we here, by the way? To glorify God. What is our purpose? To glorify God. What is your very reason for existence? To fulfill all of your sensual desires? To gratify your every craving? No. You're here to glorify God. The very purpose, the very reason for your existence. To glorify God. How do we glorify Him? We honor Him. We praise Him. We worship Him. We express to Him our adoration, our love, our thanksgiving. We confess to Him our sins. We confess to Him our faith, our joy, our appreciation. All of this is a part of praise. Nowhere in here do I see where expressions of bitterness, complaint, anger, sourness of heart and mind is a part of our adoration of the Lord. Nor do I see where a sour outlook on life glorifies the Lord. Psalms 100 and verse 2. Serve the Lord with gladness, the Bible says. Serve Him with gladness. Not because you have to. Right? Because you want to. Serve him with gladness, not with madness. Serve the Lord with gladness. So how about we deal with some of these sour attitudes? How else can we glorify the Lord? Well, I'm glad you continue to ask that question because... I want to point that out this morning, how else we glorify him. And I'd like for you to turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Perhaps you hadn't thought of it this way, but this is the way we must think of it. We're here to glorify the Lord. Our life is to glorify the Lord, to bring honor and praise to his name. Romans 4 tells us that our faith in God actually glorifies Him. Notice Romans 4 and verse 20. It speaks of Abraham here, who believed the promise of God. And it says, Romans 4.20, He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, that is what God promised, he, God, was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him, that is, his faith was imputed to him, for righteousness. And this isn't written just for his sake alone, that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses, raised again for our justification, notice it's written for us too, if we believe. You see, verse 20, Abraham's faith glorified God. It glorified God because Abraham, Abraham believed the promise of God. Abraham believed what God spoke to him. As you read a little further up in verse 18, the Bible says, Who against hope he believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. God spoke to him and said, I'm going to give you seed like the sand of the sea. And that seed is not going to come from Ishmael. It's not going to be Ishmael. It's not going to come from Hagar, but from Sarah. And verse 18, against hope, he believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Against hope, yeah. Against all hope in the physical realm, in the physical sense. Because he realized he was too old to have a child. Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, being not weak in faith, and that, that, that would indicate that it's possible to be weak in faith. That would 